Um, we are excited to present to everyone kind of a bit of an update. Um, the way we'll present is I'll start with an overview of all the curation we've done and some of the challenges that we've come across in curating genetic hearing loss. And then we'll end the call with uh, Sarah and Brandon, since they're the two primary bio curators, talking about some examples. And that way, if we run out of time, it's not a huge deal. It's just examples at the end. So the goals of the Hearing Loss Clinical Domain Working Group are pretty similar to the other working groups. Um, first, we started with outreach to identify experts and resources around the globe. And as you'll see our map, we are pretty international. And to also facilitate submission of existing variants into ClinVar. Uh, what we'll largely be talking about today is gene curation, um, so curating evidence for gene disease relationships using ClinGen's clinical validity scheme, although we are also modifying the existing ACMG, ACMG guidelines of variant classification for hearing loss and trying eventually to resolve discrepancies and become an expert panel. So this is our working group. Um, we actually are a pretty large and um, pretty international working group. Um, this is the map of all of the institutions that we have involved in the group right now. So as of right now, although we are adding new members all the time, um, people knowing other people, we have 58 members at 26 institutions across five continents. Um, it makes scheduling calls a little difficult, but the collaboration is amazing. For example, when I gave a presentation in Japan in January, I was actually able to meet some of the genetic hearing loss community over there because they were working group members we had talked to before. So it's been a wonderful experience so far. This is our uh, particular hearing loss gene curation strategy that we have uh, worked with. So uh, Sarah and Brandon are primary bio curators. So they have expertise in the ClinGen framework. They'll curate a gene disease pair first and assign a primary clinical validity classification. Then we'll pull in a content curator. I'll show you our content curators in a few slides. Um, these are usually, but not always, more junior people in the group, and they have expertise in the hearing loss domain, although not necessarily the ClinGen framework. So we'll oftentimes um, send them the curation, and then we'll schedule a WebEx and have a nice discussion about the curation and finalize the clinical validity classification at this point. However, we still bring this, um, this gene disease association to the expert group for review, um, discussing and truly finalizing before it is approved and going on the website. I should mention that the content curators, we have solicited sign up for the group, but for conflict of interest management, the person cannot be the person who discovered the gene or the gene disease association. If someone did discover the gene or the gene disease association, which has happened often in the group, they can weigh in in this final phase, but not here. So these are our ClinGen gene curation personnel. As I mentioned, Sarah and Brandon are the primary bio curators and the senior bio curator here. Um, and then our content curators are entirely volunteer. We have 13 members with a variety of different uh, backgrounds across the six institutions. So good range of experts. This is our current progress through the gene curation. I think this is already up to maybe 93 as of yesterday, but um, we have 90 gene disease pairs curated as primary curation. And then 35 of these are content reviewed, and 17 of them are expert approved, and those immediately go on the ClinGen website, the, the summary document. Um, and this is the breakdown of the gene disease uh, clinical validity associations that we have. So a large chunk of them are definitive genes because there are a lot of definitive hearing loss genes. Um, smaller chunks being moderate and limited and then um, some small other chunks. Um, strong is a little bit of a strange category as you all know because it's the same score as definitive but it's just not replicated over time. And then um, conflicting, refuted, no evidence, um, very small 4%. And um, as I'll mention in our prioritization strategy, most of the genes are for non-syndromic hearing loss, so about 70%, and then 30% are syndromic. And so now I'll talk to you about how we've uh, optimized the curation uh, for genetic hearing loss and some of the challenges we've discovered and how we've worked towards uh, dealing with those challenges. So the first challenge, and probably the biggest challenge, is hearing loss is a very heterogeneous condition. There are greater than 400 genes that have been proposed to be associated with syndromic hearing loss, and 100 of these genes alone are proposed to be associated with non-syndromic hearing loss, so literally just isolated hearing loss. So this is a huge effort, and 
ideally we'd want to get to all of them eventually, but the, the first question would be how do we prioritize these gene curations? And then a second challenge before I tell you how we prioritize is greater than 400 genes, as I mentioned, are associated with syndromic hearing loss. And some of these syndromes, hearing loss is a minor phenotype. And so how do we decide, especially with all of these genes, which syndromes to curate? For example, if hearing loss is only present in 2% of patients, really we're not the correct experts to probably be curating this gene disease association. Um, so we decided to tackle this with the aim of designing hearing loss panels in mind. So a patient that would come into a hearing loss clinic presenting initially with hearing loss and ask for, uh, or the, the physician would prescribe a hearing loss panel. And that's kind of how we evaluated this, at least in the beginning. And so this is the combined solution for those two problems. So we needed to do a prioritization of some sort. And so this was a three-phase effort. For the first phase, we wanted to do a proof of principle. Can we use the ClinGen clinical validity classification framework and show with scoring that 18 genes that we know are definitive are truly definitive using the ClinGen framework? And we could, so that was, a, that was good news. And so after these 18 definitive genes, we decided to do a rapid curation triage exercise. And so actually what we did was we pulled all the hearing loss genes that were present in the genetic testing registry on hearing loss panels out. And this is approximately 170 genes. And for this, to do this triage, we, we answered a range of different questions, and these are here on the right. So the gene, the inheritance, the disease association. Is this disease syndromic? Because as I mentioned, we are trying to curate the non-syndromic hearing loss uh, cases first. What's the clinical presentation? Is hearing loss one of the first things that the patients present with? When was the first paper reported? What's the number of HGMD DM variants? What's the spectrum of these variants? Also, what's the spectrum of the variants for pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants in ClinVar? And just general notes on anything we found in the literature that was able to, we were able to quickly find. Are there mouse models that OMIM had mentioned, et cetera? and then just rapidly assigning a clinical validity classification based on these questions. And so to go to phase three, we wanted to prioritize these rapid, or prioritize these genes based on these rapid classifications. And what we decided was we wanted to curate the limited and the moderate genes first with a non-syndromic clinical presentation because these were already on tests in the genetic testing reg registry, even if our rapid classification had shown that they really don't have very much evidence. So we thought that it was important to clarify this. Another challenge that we have found is many hearing loss genes are actually associated with multiple presentations, both syndromic and non-syndromic. So not only do we have a lot of genes, a lot of the genes are actually associated with more than one condition. And to give you a sense of the 170 genes that we triaged, 22 of them have more than one disease association. And so this gives us even more curation work to do. And so we had to ask ourselves, how can we maximize content curation efficiency because we only have 13 volunteers and this is a volunteer side position for them. And so one solution we had discussed and we've been trying to do, although um, sometimes it's easier in theory than in practice, is to give a content reviewer all curation with a, an assigned gene just to save them time because we request that they search through the literature just to make sure we haven't missed anything in the curation and it's much easier to save them literature search time if we give them all of the curations associated with one gene. And then another challenge is, of course, the large number of gene curations stretches the bandwidth of our content curators. We only have 13. So how do we make the most of our volunteer force? We decided, and I'll show you the triage in a minute, to ask content curators to only review moderate, limited, and other refuted, disputed um, genes. So this is the curation decision tree that we have. So Sarah and Brandon will perform the primary curation. If the clinical validity is definitive or strong, we'll just take it straight to the clinical domain working group. And I should mention that the gene curations are presented to the clinical domain subcommittee. These, this committee meets every other week, whereas the whole committee of the 70 or so experts meets quarterly. Um, and on any given call, there's 15 to 20 experts. 
And so these definitive and strong um, genes will be presented rapidly to the group um, and voted upon and finalized just right away. However, if they curate a gene disease association and it's moderate, limited, or other, it will get assigned to a content curator. The content curator will review our work and review the clinical validity classification, decide if we should potentially change it, and then we'll give a thorough, full presentation, pretty, pretty much showing all the evidence, showing all the scoring to the clinical domain subcommittee, and they will vote before it's entirely finalized. And these full curation presentations have actually brought out some expert requested curation additions that we thought have been interesting and have also really improved the richness of our curations. Um, interestingly, experts requested additional information and this differed based on their field of expertise. Um, some examples of what they had uh, requested were transcript information. What are all the transcripts for a particular gene? Um, do certain transcripts have different number of exons, um, unique exons? Where does the, just to give them a sense of where certain variants uh, in probands that we're scoring uh, fall. And then also all proposed disease associations for a gene, as I mentioned, a lot of genes or a decent amount of genes for hearing loss have a syndromic and a non-syndromic presentation, or even for limited and moderate genes. Um, we've seen genes that um, are proposed to have hearing loss as a disease association, and then we'll have something completely different, um, cataract, psoriasis, um, intellectual disability, et cetera. And I think they just want that to get a sense of that. And as I mentioned before, the variant spectrum for um, we uh, have already shown constraint scores, and that is requested in the SOP, but um, they really just want to get a sense of the type of variants, pathogenic or claimed pathogenic variants that have been found, both in ClinVar and HGMD, to see how the variants that we've scored would fall within that, and to give them a sense of the disease mechanism. We have a pretty thorough discussion often of the disease mechanism in these more lengthy presentations. And so some ongoing projects that we're working on, um, either in um, collaboration with other ClinGen curators and other groups are um, just in the hearing loss group or just at LMM. So uh, I think we've discussed this with some people before. We are working on gene curation blurbs. And when I say blurb, I mean a little descriptive paragraph that kind of gives you the sense of the evidence for the gene disease association and the curation without having to go very deeply into the curation. And oftentimes, this isn't necessarily obvious just by looking at the summary matrix with the PubMed IDs and the point scores. So we're trying to develop some standardized language for um, each different piece of evidence, and we're hoping to share this eventually with uh, other curators to get some feedback. And then also some pre-curation documentation, and this is in conjunction with other <coughs> curators across ClinGen. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, the hearing loss experts had asked for some different pieces of information that would be relevant for both the gene and variant uh, curation that I think has really enhanced the richness of a lot of our curations. And we'd like to share that with other groups just to try to enhance their curations too and enhance the knowledge of the public. So um, those are things that we're that are ongoing. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Sarah and Brandon to talk about some of the examples that kind of address some of the challenges that I've mentioned previously in the slides. Great. So I'm going to start with an example that we haven't yet gone over with any experts, um, but is a really interesting example of um, a syndromic hearing loss where the presentation isn't totally clear, so I'll go through sort of what evidence is out there and then discuss the lumping and splitting issue that we have. Um, this gene disease relationship between DIAF1 and sensory neural hearing loss and macrothrombocytopenia was um, first reported in 1997. However, this family um, in the founder paper was only studied for hearing loss. Um, the blood disorder was either subclinical or not present in this family. And as you can see in this pedigree, it's a massive family over seven generations. Um, and the variant, which was a plus one splice variant, um, segregated perfectly with the non-syndromic hearing loss. Um, and so this obviously got quite a bit of points. I, um, I believe it, we, I gave it seven segregation points and two variant points, um, rather 1.5 variant points for the dominant um, 
for the dominant loss of function variant. Um, and there actually weren't any other papers reported on this gene disease relationship until 2016, or no papers that I decided to score until 2016. Um, and two papers in 2016 came out um, with a new phenotype associated with this gene and with this hearing loss. Um, and in all affected individuals with variants, they found this macrothrombocytopenia, which is a enlargement um, of blood platelets. And um, so this was interesting because this disease can be mild. Um, and the authors of these papers proposed that this massive Costa Rican family in the founder paper may have actually had this blood disorder, but were never tested for it. Um, and so that's a big unknown. They, as far as I know, haven't gone back to this family and tested for this blood disorder. Um, so the mechanism is also not super clear because this gene was first discovered in Drosophila, um, and it has some um, evidence that it binds with different cytoskeletal elements, which can be um, is a reasonable explanation for the hearing loss because um, the hair cells in the cochlea are, um, have microvilli that um, rely heavily on um, actin skeletal elements, and um, platelet formation also relies on cytoskeletal um, construction. I'm not super experienced with blood disorders, so, um, however, it's not unreasonable that, that this gene can cause both of these diseases mechanistically um, based on the experimental evidence. So there was a um, Drosophila model that they, they um, found to have hearing loss, although the ability to de detect hearing loss in flies is questionable. Um, but there actually was also a mouse model with one of the patient variants um, in one of the 2016 papers that did have a progressive hearing loss similar to patients with um, with the variant. So there was enough um, experimental evidence to max out that, um, that category as well. And so finally we run into this problem where there, the hearing loss phenotype, there's plenty of evidence that it's a definitive gene for hearing loss. However, um, because that first paper didn't test for this blood phenotype, um, that would end up only at a strong classification. And we haven't yet sort of discussed whether we should um, classify these separately and call, call the hearing loss phenotype definitive and the combination of the hearing loss and the blood disorder strong, um, or if we should just go with the combination of them and call it strong. Um, so that's going to be a sort of interesting conversation to have with the, with the working group. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a great example of a sort of lumping and splitting issue where um, it's not super clear if this gene is causing one disorder or multiple. Yeah. Um, and that's so it's just Danny, we, we've seen examples like this too, where um, if the authors just haven't looked into a particular phenotype, it's just you just don't yeah. have the information. It's so hard. What, one quick question I had, and this isn't really going to resolve the issue, but um, what were the variants in the families that had the macrothrombocytopenia? Were they um, were they also uh, null variants? There were, there were or? a combination of missense variants and um, frame shift. So there, I think one okay. of the families had missense, and one of them had a frame shift. So okay. the mouse model had the um, had the mis missense variant. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, can so you just again, was, so can uh, you just clarify uh, like what um, when you're when you're talking about lumping or splitting? So um, I've also seen there's like another um, curation group or clenching group that's specifically working on lumping and splitting. So what like lumping would be um, putting the, the two phenotypes together that exactly. that, that the variant causes both. Okay. Yeah. Yes, so we're coming up, excuse me, sorry, this is Courtney, yes, um, we're coming up with guidelines to have curators use to figure out with lumping and splitting, um, and so hopefully we'll be able to work through that with different examples to give to people, but it's essentially what you've talked about is that we need to be able to go through and assess based on our criteria whether you need to, you can curate for an isolated phenotype, in this case hearing loss, or whether it needs to be lumped into the bigger syndrome based on what we've gone through with the experts. Okay, thanks. So maybe, maybe I missed this. So you said that the macrothrombocytopenia, that has a strong association based only yes. on genetic evidence? 
on genetic evidence and the, some of the experimental evidence um, did use um, investigated um, expression in in, play, in patient playlists. But the mouse model so with the, hear, hearing loss of the well, didn't, well, didn't the blood of the of the mouse model now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's what I want. So there's okay. kind of a combination of of experimental evidence of the hearing loss phenotype and the blood phenotype, but um, some of it's overlapping, some of it isn't. Right. But there is plenty of evidence for both um, to, to reach strong or right. definitive. So I think that we will end up probably um, lumping these two conditions and saying that suggesting, you know, suggesting to um, geneticists that find variants in this to test patients for this blood disorder if they find pathogenic variants in this gene, that kind of thing. So um, this is just an interesting um, example. And yeah. for my next, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say um, that that makes a lot of sense, in considering the fact they didn't look for that phenotype in the first family. And this is a really yeah, great example for lumping and splitting. So exactly. thank you for presenting that. Um, so Courtney, this might be a good one to put on the list for that too. Great, thanks. Um, thanks. This next gene disease pair that um, is sort of a good example of one of the really strong, really solid, definitive genes that. Um, we presented straight to the, the um, subcommittee group rather than getting it content curated. USH1C causes Usher syndrome, type 1 to Usher syndrome, which is a congenital hearing loss with progressive retinitis pigmentosa. Um, and it's, USH1C was one of the first genes that were discovered in, in this condition, and there's just a ton of evidence that this causes um, Usher syndrome. So this was one of the ones that Brandon and I did at the very start to sort of train ourselves in gene creation. Um, and this is this is also a good example of a time where it's really important to get the full variant spectrum in our um, presentation to the group because often when we're doing these definitive curations, we reach we reach max points really early on and don't necessarily get a, a full picture of the variant spectrum. Um, in this case. The Usher, all the Usher variants are loss of function variants. Um, there's a few missense um, that have been reported, um, but overwhelmingly, a loss of function of a, a homozygous loss of function of this gene causes Usher syndrome. Um, so I'm not going to go through each of the pieces of evidence here. It's um, there's multiple mouse models. The first one, um, the deaf circular mouse, um, had a hearing loss but no retinal phenotype, which is actually something that is common to most um, Usher syndrome mouse models, and there's been a fair amount of research into why that's the case, and it, it presumably has to do with different expression patterns and different splice isoforms in um, mice from different from humans. Um, however, the um, a mouse model in 2010 was published that was the first Usher syndrome mouse model that had um, a retinal phenotype, and they actually used the knock-in um, conditional mouse model, I believe, that um, that had both phenotypes. And there was also a rescue for that um, with um, oligomorphalinos. Um, and actually, also, in 2017, just in March, a paper was just published on this gene, um, on this mouse model in particular, that used um, viral vector um, gene therapy in these mice and rescued hearing. So that is a huge um, sort of step in hopefully eventually treating Usher syndrome um, in, in, in humans. So um, this is a, a typical gene um, that we have done. There's probably 10 or 20 genes of this type that um, have been pretty straightforward curations. Um, OK, so this is another um, interesting gene that we actually reviewed yesterday with, the call, with our group. Um, and the, it's, it's notable because our points, the way we scored the points got it to 10 points. Um, and we actually did a content review with an expert, and she agreed with um, a moderate classification. But when we presented to the working group the first time, there was some doubt that, we, um, that, that this was a moderate gene. And, and several experts were sort of hesitant to call it moderate and wanted some more information. So we went back and represented it. Um, and we all ended up at a limited classification. Um, so 
the one and only paper that has published this gene associating it with hearing loss was in 2014. They did whole exome sequencing on two patients, the ones um, with red squares around them in the pedigree, and identified this variant. And then they did a linkage analysis of the family. Um, this variant was in the linkage region. And it was a um, non-sense mutation really close to the end of the um, gene. It was in the last exon. And it was absent from NOMAD. So um, they concluded that this variant was causing their hearing loss. And the family was consanguineous from Pakistan. Um, and their calculated LOD score was 5.8. So we gave this um, family seven segregation points and one variant point because um, we're not sure that it's a true loss of function, that it might be just a, um, a truncated protein. Um, the hearing loss was prelingual, but only mild to moderate in severity. And um, the hearing loss was mixed sensory neural and conductive. And one of our experts, who's actually a, a clinician, an ENT, um, was sort of hesitant because of this really mild phenotype, um, that it's not really convincing that, um, that mo I mean, most sensory neural hearing loss that's genetic is, is much more severe than this. So that was one sort of red flag for, for our experts. Um, for the experimental evidence, they um, made a knockdown zebrafish model. Um, and the zebrafish ADCY1 gene actually has two um, isoforms. And there was sort of a different phenotype in, in the knockdown of, of each isoform. So I, we downgraded those uh, animal model points to one. Um, there was an expression study that this gene was expressed in inner hair cells, outer hair cells, and other um, structures in the cochlea. And that was repeated in, in rats and mice. And then finally, they um, transfected this, this variant into COS cells. Um, and there was a protein product that was evaded nonsense media decay. Um, but the localization and the association with the plasma membrane was, was disrupted um, caused by the variant. So they proposed that the mechanism of this hearing loss in this family is that this protein is not um, localizing properly. So we ended up with two points for experimental, eight points for genetic, um, with a total of 10. And there actually has been a fair amount of study on this gene um, in the context of the, the brain and neurological phenotypes. Um, there was a spontaneous um, null mouse model in 1996 um, for which hearing has never been assessed until, yeah, so actually I take that back. There was a hearing assessment in 2002. You can see in the Tremblay 2002 paper. Um, however, uh, the authors of this, this 2014 paper um, didn't, really, didn't really agree with the conclusions that were made. And there may or may not have been a hearing loss in, in this mouse. And so this mouse model is not, we didn't score this mouse model. Um, it has some neurological phenotypes that don't have to do with, with hearing. Um, so because, um, because this variant is not a null variant, uh, and because there's only been one family, our experts were, wanted this gene to be, to be limited. Um, and that's what we ended up with for, for that. Um, Brandon is now going to present a few more examples. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Cushman, and I'm going to present a couple more interesting gene curation examples that we found uh, while curating for hearing loss. So this first one is DNMT1 and its association with DNMT1 methylopathy. Um, so the interesting, the thing that first caught me with this gene disease curation was that when I started, uh, when I started this curation, I was actually looking at it for two separate disorders that I was finding throughout the literature. The first was a hereditary sensory, sensory neuropathy, and the second was a syndromic condition with um, cataplexy, ataxia, deafness, and narcolepsy. Um, and I actually got probably halfway through uh, these curations for these two separate diseases before I started running into papers that were lumping these two conditions into um, this one 
this one lump condition could just titled DNMT1 methylopathy. Um, so it was a it was a situation where I had started curating, thinking I was curating for two things, when in the end I ended up lumping them together. Um, and another interesting thing about this condition is that the uh, there, the more severe phenotypes here, such as the uh, cataplexy, the narcolepsy, um, and there also is a cerebral phenotype with this, um, a cerebral atrophy phenotype with this, actually had an earlier onset um, than the hearing loss that was found in these patients. The hearing loss was uh, a later presentation. So one of the questions we were looking at here is, should we even recommend this to people? Um, should this be on hearing loss panels? Because they're most likely these patients would not present at a hearing loss clinic. Um, they would probably present to physicians for some of the more severe phenotypes that they experience. And this is, in fact, on hearing loss panels because that's how we got our triage units too. So that was something yes. to consider. And it is currently found on hearing loss panels. Uh, so this is kind of a quick summary of the curation. Uh, and one thing I do want to point out is when I did look back at the separate conditions that I was looking at, they neither of them reached definitive. I believe one was a strong and the other one was a moderate. Um, but when lumped together, these uh, did add up to a definitive classification. So something to keep in mind in this discussion about um, lumping and splitting. Um, so multiple probands, uh, two, one moderately sized family and one very large family um, gave this more than the maximum of genetic evidence points. And then there were, the experimental evidence was a lot based upon these methylation studies, these functional studies, to kind of determine the effect that uh, variance in these, this gene has on the methylation state of the DNA. This and, is a methyltransferase. Yep, yeah, sorry, this is a methyltransferase gene. And so this reached definitive, and when we reviewed it, we brought this straight to our, um, straight to our working group call and reviewed it with the experts there. They agreed it was definitive, but like I mentioned before, we decided it most likely shouldn't be on hearing loss panels due to the later onset of the hearing loss and the more severe phenotypes with the earlier uh, presentation. The second gene I want to go over is um, Barton or BSND. And this is causative of both barter syndrome and autosomal recessive non-syndromic hearing loss. Um, so this is another one of those genes where we decided to split the condition here because they actually have um, two mechanisms of disease here. The variant spectrum is pretty specific. Missense variance in this gene can cause autosomal recessive non-syndromic hearing loss, whereas the loss of function variants cause barter syndrome. And Barter syndrome is a syndrome that involves a renal phenotype in addition to the hearing loss phenotype. Another interesting thing about this is that when you knock out the gene in mice, it's embryonic lethal. So the only way they were able to study this effect um, in mice was to do a conditional knockout in just the inner ear. So this did not uh, kind of recapitulate a renal phenotype. So for Barter syndrome, this gene reached a definitive uh, pretty quickly, just with a couple studies. Um, there were a lot of different probands, and they were all loss of function variants, so that added up the points pretty quickly. Uh, and there was also a, as you can see, a wealth of experimental evidence on this, where they looked at this in the in the conditional knockout, which we. Uh, did have a discussion about scoring with our experts because it is just in the inner ear, so it can't mirror that renal phenotype. And then they also had a lot of other functional studies associating this, showing that it interacts with other known um, proteins that are involved in Barter syndrome, 
as well as the some channels that it interacts with as well that would lead to this phenotype. And as I mentioned before, I did a second curation for the separate autosomal recessive hearing loss phenotype. Um, and this one actually only ended up at moderate because a lot of this um, genetic evidence that I looked at was actually a result of a founder mutation. Um, so in a lot of these, I didn't end up scoring these programs. Uh, these, this a lot of this segregation evidence that would have been scored, uh, as I mentioned, it would have, um, it, I would have scored these 36 segregations here and it would have been more than enough, but it was actually a founder mutation in the Pakistani population. So with our experts, we decided not to score the, that segregation evidence um, and only to score the, pr the probands once for that specific mutation. Um, there was another mutation that was found. However, when I looked at this in EXAC and NOMAD, it had a very high frequency in the general population. So I did not score this Miyagawa um, proband due to that. And a lot of this experimental evidence was kind of shared between the two. Uh, so as I mentioned before, this knockout mouse model was scored with less hesitance this time because we were specifically looking at the non-syndromic hearing loss phenotype which the mouse showed. So these were just a couple of examples that I pulled up that I thought were interesting and some of which were kind of running uh, representative of the issues we've been running into on um, these challenges uh, as we were calling them uh, in hearing loss gene curation. If we have a little more time, I just wanted to go back to one of um, the genes that I just did because there was another point I wanted to make about um, segregation points that we've been running into a lot with our working group um, where um, this is this is the family that this applies to. So basically um, in families like this where um, there is a fair amount of segregation, but you just need one family to get to seven points, basically. And a lot of our experts have been really sort of confused about that and hesitant about that. Um, I don't know if any other groups have run into this, but um, a lot of the times this segregation evidence is inflating a gene up to moderate or strong um, from only one paper, and there may not actually be any replication of it. And um, yeah, because it, it, our I think the problem that the experts had, um, particularly Heidi agreeing with them, was um, that the segregation data is implicating potentially the locus, not necessarily yeah. the gene, and that one family, if it's very large, because a lot of the papers do find very large consanguineous families, could easily bump a gene, uh, max, max out the segregation points and bump a gene to moderate with only one family. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen examples like this too. I mean, I looked at a gene recently that actually was two large families, but um, with a bunch of missense variants too, with really no evidence to support them. And I had kind of had the same question, like, do we really know that it's this particular variant that's causing the condition in these families, or is it a um, another variant within that gene, or even a different gene that's next door, you know? So um, I think that's a really good point. And um, I don't know, has anyone else come across situations like this? And how have you handled it? It really, yeah, it's tough with it when it's just one particular family. And yeah, I think I would have that concern as well. Um, yeah. And maybe, I think, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead, Marina. I was going to say, at this point, we've decided to score by the letter of the matrix and just kind of make a note of some of the ones that we've downgraded and uh -huh. um, just as a future thing, potentially assigning caps to the number of segregation points that one family could get. Um, but yeah. that would be something to discuss down the road. Yeah. We're also right. requiring more than one family or more than one variant to reach a higher than limited or moderate classification. Yeah. The other, the other thing to look at is that there may be a caveat that we can make, but if what you're seeing in this family as well is, is all the consanguinity, right? And, and a lot of the people that end up being affected come from consanguineous parents. 
um, or, or a, a consanguineous relationship. So there's going to be increased regions of heter of homozygosity, right? And so yeah. that in itself could already potentially be not like an artifact, so to speak, but rather it could be having it could be a contributing factor to them seeing these affected individuals and and and, and it being linked <clears throat> particularly to this variant and, and this gene. And so I could see taking that into consideration. I don't know. I, I'm wondering if, if this is something you're taking into consideration within the way that we count segregation points of having a caveat in the SOP, this, in the SOP for instance, that says note if there is evidence of consanguinity to be cautious in how points are counted where we potentially would not count the full number of points. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. And, and this family, even though they use whole exome sequencing, um, that isn't necessarily a tell that, that this is more convincing of a pathogenic variant, um, just because there probably are many more um, than usual homozygous variants in this. Yeah, in these exactly. Affected people. Yeah, and if they hadn't specifically done, I guess, homozygosity mapping and looked at other genes in those regions, although even a small, I guess, a small area if it contains your pathogenic variant, might not come up with that anyway. But um, And I'm just looking at the descriptions um, in the SOP for the different classifications. So, I mean, this would definitely fit the limited category, but for moderate, right. um, you know, it says at least three unrelated probands harboring variants with sufficient supporting evidence. So, I mean, this definitely seems to fit the, um, the limited category more than the, the moderate. So, um, yeah, so definitely, um, yeah, tough one. So, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we agree. Um, I think that's all the examples we have, but if we have questions or discussion, we definitely have time for that. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the um, founder uh, variants because yeah, I mean, exactly. we've been talking about this a lot yeah. too um, in terms of, you know, counting segregation points or not or how many times should right. you be right. counting right. these people, you know, yeah. and so on. Um, I um, say that uh, Barter, this one, um, we have content reviewed, but it has not been finalized by the group yet. So we can say okay. this is what we've discussed, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the, the whole hearing loss group hasn't said anything yet, but we'd love to hear what you have to say about it too. Is this and is there any evidence of consanguinity within this family? Yes, yeah. we a, a large amount of consanguinity again. Yeah. Okay, I bring that up because of the previous uh, example. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fair so that for a lot that, of the I could, recessive diseases. And it, the it, loss, I should say. Okay, and with this being a uh, okay, um, and this is the only. I'm looking at your papers. Okay, you've got a couple of other papers over there as well that also lend segregation evidence. Mm -hmm. And I hate to ask this again, but is there consanguinity within those papers? Yes, yeah. uh, the these were also, okay. con there, was, there was one family that I believe had a low amount of consanguinity, but mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was a different mutation. It wasn't the okay. founder mutation. Um, so I did count those. Did we and know for sure that it wasn't a founder mutation, like it was a different variant, or was it the same variant, but there was It was a different analysis? variant. Okay. Yeah. I almost, for founder mutations, would just rather say if there's known founder mutations and it's a specific mm -hmm. variant, that you should count the segregation points total, but only count one proband instead of counting multiple probands for it. Um, you can kind of default that they are especially from a, a specific ethnicity that they could be from that founder population. Okay, so you you do count the segregation evidence in this case, but just only one variant evidence, uh, only one proband for variant evidence? That's what I did with the founder mutation I had. I gave okay. the max seven points for segregation, which I could get off of one family pedigree I had alone. Mm -hmm. um, but then I did not count any other proband with that specific variant um, for the fact that they probably are from this founder. Um, there was only okay. one other Greek population, so I kind of looked at ethnicity yeah. and made sure if any person was within this ethnicity or within so much range of it, that they were potentially that founder. Um, yeah. So okay. for the specific gene I had, there were two founders. One was a Greek population, one was Dutch. So anyone who was Dutch, German, and then there was an American of German descent, I did not count any of those probands. I counted one in the full segregation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great, that's really useful, thank you.
And in other disorders we've seen, if they've had case control studies, I wouldn't necessarily expect it for this, but if they've had case control studies, we've just counted the case control studies as points. Yeah, that definitely mm -hmm. makes more sense. Yeah. There's kind of a major lack of case control yeah. studies in hearing loss, yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, we've seen that with, with other ones as well. So I guess a kind of um, question related to founder variants is if you are seeing the same variant repeated again and again, but it seems to be in different populations, but you don't have any haplotype data to indicate whether or not those families are related or not. Um, you know, what, what do we do with that? I mean, if you're counting the same variant again and again, potentially you could be inflating the score, yeah, but then, exactly. you know, if it's, ever, if it's, yeah, but then if it's arising independently, which you won't know if you don't have haplotype data, but if it's arising independently, that could actually kind of um, increase your suspicion that maybe this is a pathogenic variant. So, um, mm -hmm. what if, well, how have you been handling those sorts of situations? Um, I think it's, we, rely heavily on the experts knowing um, mm -hmm. founder mutations, but right. a lot of the time, um, if it's a very obvious, we've won, run a couple, across a couple situations where clearly it was the same variant in a very same population, even if okay. they didn't claim that they were related. So yes, sure. we only scored it once. Um, uh -huh. And a lot of times um, this does happen for the definitive gene, so we really do try to get as many unique variants as right. possible. But I completely agree with you that if that is evidence, you know, that it's shown up independently multiple times in different populations, that's strong evidence for, um, I think, the gene and also the, also the pathogenicity of the variant. So um, right. definitely something tricky to deal with. Yeah, yeah, it is. But yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the way we've been thinking about it too. So this is really helpful to go through these examples with y'all. Thank you so much um, mm -hmm. for doing that. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, something out of interest, I think it was the methylopathy gene where um, mm -hmm. uh, Brandon, I think you said then you had lumped them together. So, you know, this is something that we are coming across with HCM as well, you know, exactly which conditions should we be lumping together versus splitting. And then, you know, as you start to include more conditions, then you kind of, your score goes up, obviously. Um, right. It certainly seems like there was a lot of evidence here to say that these two were really um, part of the same condition. But um, I mean, I don't really have an answer for this, but I think it's, you know, it can be a challenge too, like in cardiomyopathy, like exactly which cardiac conditions are really part of this whole thing or are they actually separate? And as we continue to add more and more things, could we just be artificially inflating the score? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like for, for this condition, I mean, this really made sense, but um, definitely just something to, to keep in mind as well, you know, thinking about those kind of issues. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. With this one, I was lucky because it, the literature just came to a consensus over time. Everyone started, there were actually, there was one publication that said these are the same and mm -hmm. provided evidence for that. So that was, that was nice. Right. And definitely, um, I think, you know, puts a lot of weight in, um, you know, the sort of pre-curation pre that we're thinking about in terms of mm -hmm. trying to gather some of this information ahead of ahead of time. Um, because, yeah, I mean, that information can be kind of buried in there sometimes. It can be hard to, to find and, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Brandon, yeah. it's interesting. So that paper that you just mentioned when they lumped essentially these two, mm -hmm. can you send it around? Uh, yeah, I'll go back through and find it and I can send it out after the call. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at what rationale they had to uh, lump together, unless you can state that briefly, so. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a, a more practical question, too, about um, the review by experts and things like that. So when you are on your large group calls, um, are you, presumably you're presenting this information on PowerPoint slides similar to what you're doing here. And yeah. I was just curious, how many genes do you get through on a call? Uh, yeah. Or is that really variable, I guess, depending uh, on the gene? Well, that's the huge bottleneck, and as you can see in our summary slide, um, yeah. we have, what, 13 out of 90 currently expert approved? Uh -huh. Yeah. 17, 17 out of 90 currently. So it's really slow going. And yeah. then we get to these sort of controversial genes or the ones that yeah. aren't so clear. We can spend like half a call or a whole call just on one gene and right. it's, it's difficult. 
Um, yeah, and I should say we are, because it's so difficult to get all the experts together at one time, we are literally just having one call for variant specification and gene curation. Yeah, so oh, wow. right now it's just if gene curation has time at the end, we right. present a couple. Right. Um, we're hoping that after we specify the variant uh, curation rules, we'll have a lot more time for gene curation, but yeah, it's definitely a bottleneck for sure. Yeah. And I would say we've we've had a similar experience with HCM where um, I was going to do what I thought was a quick quick gene last time and it right. took the whole hour. Yeah. So yeah. I was just curious, you know. Um, but yeah, it seems like a, a similar yeah, exactly. experience. So yeah, yeah. All right. Um, does anyone else have other questions? No. So uh, this is. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering about the conflicting genes. Those were all disputed or any of them were, uh, like, you know, refuted? And what we was have the one refuted. Of... We have one refuted hearing loss gene, myosin 1A. Um, and there have been a couple of papers publish it, published um, actually refuting that gene disease relationship, and, and we have curated that but not reviewed it yet. Yeah, and I think there was another one that GJB3 um, where we're going back and forth between re um, refuted and disputed, and that there, or even just limited evidence, a la what was it, um, Paul B2 or PMS2, which the, the one gene curation um, working group one that Fergus had said was probably limited. Um, so we're going back and forth in between that for GJB3 because it really um, is it the question that has the literature shown truly that it's refuted for the gene disease association, or is it just shown that there's really not any evidence? Or the gene so, disease association. Right. So when uh, you guys are curating that, so you guys are getting into a limited category, or yeah, we and are. Then, so, or is it like higher, and then you say you refuted or disputed that? I'm just want, wondering what their experience is. For that gene, um, there. I mean, in general, for that category. Okay. Um, I guess it depends. Yeah. Um, we don't uh, like you saw on that slide. We don't have a ton of. Um, genes in that category, but at least for GJB3, there have been sort of, I think around 18 or 20 um, published probands um, and very little to no segregations and actually some non-segregations. Um, but there is some functional evidence that um, indicates that that gene is expressed in the ear. So uh -huh. that's pretty much the only thing that all of these, these papers are going off of and that it's really similar to GJB2, which is the most common cause of hearing loss. Um, so but then you are there, there isn't anything, aside from like maybe some non-segregations in families, um, there isn't really anything indicating. And you are calling it like, limited or, 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 or disputed? It's, it's right now it's at limited, but we haven't just yeah, with un, anyone yet. Unfortunately, we were able to score like one or two variants based on their segregations. And okay, I see. Yeah, because there was no reason that we couldn't yeah. really. Um, yeah. But there isn't really strong evidence for yeah. any variants. Yeah. yeah. But we haven't mm -hmm. presented it to the group yet. It's just been content reviewed. And that's really challenging too when you see a bunch of these misdense variants that you don't have a lot of experimental evidence for. I mean, we come across this as, as well a lot with HCM and you know how to handle those and scoring them and um, really challenging. And I know that you know Jonathan had encouraged us to give them just uh, as he would say a whiff of points um, because you don't know one way or the other. But um, you know we definitely had a lot of discussion about that in our HCM group um, because people on the other hand would say, well, you don't you don't know this is pathogenic. It could just be benign. So why are we why are we giving it any Thing. Could you be inflating the score? So it's it's you know can be can be tough. And again, a gene I just looked at was was like that, like hundreds of VUSs, but really absolutely no experimental evidence for any of them. I mean, most of them were in ClinVar. There weren't a huge number that were reported, but um, it's just it's kind of tough to, to know what to do in those situations. Yep. Well, and I guess with lack of segregation, I mean, it could be I guess it could be a penetrance issue as well, right? So. Yeah, that's um, what the authors plan. 